Management Working Group Subgroup Missile Defense. And if you look up there, uh, you'll see Patrick Morin, who is the chairperson of our Missile Defense Group, and Richard, who is a member, and also Subrata Gashroy, also a member. So we welcome you. Uh, tonight, uh, we have these three wonderful speakers. Uh, and let me just tell you a little bit about them. But before I do, uh, I will also uh, let you know sort of the format of what's going to happen tonight. Um, but also that we will have a Q&A and we want to hear all of your questions. And to do that, to ask a question, if you would just go down to the bottom of your screen, at least it's on the bottom of my screen, to uh, the reactions button. And uh, there's a raised hand. Uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll call on people. I'll call on people in order. And just a word about that. Try to make your questions real questions so we have a good discussion going and we have time for everybody to get their questions answered. And if you have something else that you'd like to let people know about, please put it in chat. Uh, also, might be nice, you know, we have a nice cozy group here to let us know where you're coming from. So in chat, you can put your name uh, and where you live uh, and anything else you'd like to put about you. So, uh, Keep yourselves muted until the Q&A, and then when it's a turn to ask a question, a call will unmute you, so don't worry about that. So tonight, tonight we are so pleased to have this discussion. Uh, and we have three, again, three wonderful speakers. Richard Krushnik. Uh, Richard writes about military corporate influence over US foreign policy, the Ukraine war, and Raytheon technologies. He continues to be involved in the community development financing in Cambridge, Massachusetts and Nicaragua. He works with MAPA's Nuclear Disarmament Working Group and Latin American Caribbean Working Group and Mass Public Banking. Richard, hi. And then also we have Patrick Morin, who I mentioned, who's the chair of our illustrious committee. And Patrick is a member of the Nuclear Disarmament Working Group of Mass Peace Action, and he's a graduate student in the MIT Laboratory for Nuclear Science. And he lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, Patrick, what degree are you finishing up and um, that you're? Uh, PhD in nuclear physics. Thank you. Uh, and then Subrata Goshroy. Subrata is a longtime member of this group and has spoken with us before about missile defense. And in fact, he was a person who got us all involved with the issues and the dangers of missile defense, which actually we know is really missile offense. Subrat is a research affiliate at the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies Program in Science, Technology, and Society. He is also a specially appointed professor at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, Japan. Earlier, he was for many years a senior engineer in the field of high energy lasers. He was also a professional staff member of the House National Security Committee and later a senior analyst with the Government Accountability Office. Um, so as you see, we have three people who have got a lot of experience, different perspectives, and they are here to uh, share their thoughts with you. And then just to say uh, a, a minute of uh, about the format. Uh, so, Richard, um, after this, I'm going to hand this over to Richard, and Richard will really talk about the substance of what this, of what tonight's program is about. Uh, and then he'll turn it over to um, Subrata, 
and Sabrata will cover strategic and intercontinental missile defense, and Patrick will cover intermediate range missile defense, and then Richard will come again and cover tactical battlefield missile defense. And what we're going to do is each person will speak for no more than nine minutes, and then we'll have four minutes of discussion after each speaker. Now, when you talk about a question for you speakers, when you talk about um, four minutes of discussion, now is that Q&A or is that just four minutes of discussion between the three of you? Q&A. Great, okay. Um, and then that'll all be followed by 20 minutes of Q&A. So, um, Get ready to uh, be prepared and uh, hear about our missile offense. Richard. Um, the basic uh, point that we want to try to make is that um, missile offense and missile defense are two sides of the same coin. Uh, you can't have an effective missile offense unless you have at least some semblance of a partially effective missile defense, because your enemy is going to have the same kind of offensive missiles you have. And so if you use some nuclear missiles on an enemy, you're going to get some nuclear missiles in return. Uh, so a, any, any kind of successful engagement for one side that involves nuclear weapons means that side has got to have uh, at least a somewhat serious missile defense, okay? Uh, it so happens that in the three areas we're covering tonight, uh, intercontinental, strategic, intermediate range, you know, a few hundred miles to a few thousand miles, and then battlefield tactical, uh, a few miles to 100 or 800 miles maybe, uh, all three areas, uh, your three speakers tonight think that there is no effective missile defense against any of these types of nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, the US is still looking to get effective missile defense against nuclear weapons, but so far it's, it's a chimera that uh, is very far from reality. Um, and uh, we are approaching a, a more serious situation, greater danger of nuclear war. A lot of people are talking about it. So that's what we're going to look at in uh, a little more detail. And Subrata is going to start us off with uh, intercontinental or strategic missile defense. Thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, thank you, Susan, for the introduction. and. Um, I'm glad to be back here again uh, at the MAPA-sponsored uh, webinar to talk about missile defense, offense as well. Um, uh, <laughs> so my uh, part of the discussion is about uh, what Richard said, is, is a strategic systems, which is goes back to the origin of the missile defense program in the United States and elsewhere. And that is at the time in the 60s and 70s, it was only intercontinental ballistic missiles that the Soviet Union had and the United States were both were building up is the only thing that was going. And so the discussion about the stopping these missiles um, started in, in uh, full swing, particularly in the United States after Von Braun um, set up shop in Huntsville, Alabama. And um, so this is the strategic system. It's a code word for bi primarily systems, uh, intercontinental and uh, continental range, 5,000 uh, um, kilometers and over. And um, you know, the flight times of these missiles are about 20 to 30 minutes. And so the, in the 80s, when after several attempts to build a missile defense system in this country failed in the 60s and 70s. And one was um, um, uh, after about $2 billion was spent, uh, the Nike system, uh, 
put in place and turned off the next day because um, uh, it was found totally ridiculous. Uh, so, and the Russians tried, the Soviet Union tried similar things. Americans, uh, I, and I got involved in this back in the 70s when we were developing uh, high power lasers. And um, in the 80s, when Ronald Reagan came to power, we had the Strategic Defense Initiative, which introduced the high power laser as one of the ways to uh, stop um, stop uh, Soviet missiles. So none of them came to uh, any kind of success. Uh, and I was part of that effort for 10, 15 years. And uh, then the, the thing kind of changed. So the strategic systems that we were developing then changed, morphed into the other systems that, that um, Patrick and uh, Richard are going to talk about in terms of uh, short range. But the primary point about the strategic system is the, its impact on global nuclear strategic stability. Because if you have a missile defense system uh, that whether it works or not is an issue, but as long as you are building like we are in the United States, the Russians and the Chinese have to take account of that and have to respond accordingly as to how to stop this system. Because once you have a defensive system, then you can stop the uh, any any attack uh, as um, a second response from Russia in the face of a, um, uh, a nuclear first attack, which really the dream of um, many in the U.S. military going back to the Manhattan Project in the 1940s. So this ability to have the first strike uh, goes back a long way, and the missile defense actually provides this kind of a belief that if we have the missile defense system, we can go and and and, and attack uh, Russia first. And uh, but the Russians have missiles that they will launch, etc. So the arms race is is happening, although the Russians and Chinese are not responding the way Soviet Union did in facing the SDI back in the 80s, because first of all, these systems are highly complex, almost nearly impossible to work from both physics and uh, engineering uh, uh, points of view. And I was part of the engineering development of these systems and, and these systems don't work. So Russians <laughs> know that, but, and again, they have to respond. So there, instead of building a second time, a highly expensive defensive system, they are opting for perhaps hypersonic weapons that can maneuver in the atmosphere and, and make it even more difficult to the missile defense system. But the strategic stability is grossly violated or impaired by the development of missile defense systems. And they were always uh, accepted by both countries, the Soviet Union and the United States. And that's why the anti-ballistic missile treaty was signed that you should not be attempting to build missile defense system because it will bring more offense and an arms race. And it did. So it was the ABM treaty was signed in 1972, a bilateral treaty between the US and, 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 and Soviet Union. And it lasted for over 30 years and, and, and really kept strategic stability and peace in the world. But uh, George Bush and the neocons uh, came in the power in 2001 and immediately withdrew unilaterally from ABM treaty uh, 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 with saying that, well, we have other kinds of threats that we have to worry about, which is this mm -hmm. so-called diffuse threat from Iran, Iraq, Libya, et cetera. And many of these countries are now wiped out anyways. But so, this is the thing, and, 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 and even under Biden administration, we are funding it at the level of $30 billion, doing many things that Reagan, uh, um, that the remnants of Reagan's, Reagan system, and then uh, uh, Trump and, and so on and so forth. So it's still going on, huge, hugely uh, funded program now, 30 something billion dollars this year, but, and, and I think about six or 8 billion going to the strategic system, which is called, called the, the GMD. So from that point of view, I think that the, I think the activist community, we together uh, really have to put missile defense on the agenda, given how closely we are coming to a potential nuclear escalation 
in uh, in, in Ukraine. And uh, um, so uh, uh, I just want to see quickly what else I, I want to see. Uh, well, um, <clears throat> uh, I think I've covered mostly. So I uh, just one point about uh, missile defense and Congress, and I just mentioned uh, by um, that uh, even under Biden administration, the Democratic administration, we are still spending a lot of money on the system. And altogether, since Reagan started in the mid 1980s until today, in my uh, estimation, it, we have spent well over $300 billion. Just in the last two decades, it's about 170 to $180 billion on missile defense, where this, none of the systems have been really proven. Now, we, you will hear a lot about missile defense now in the context of the Ukraine war and that, that the Ukrainian systems are shooting down lots of Russian missiles, even Russian hypersonic missile, which I mean, I don't know how, but um, the, even the Patriot batteries were hyped a big time as to be the game changer. They haven't. Actually, the Patriot has been attacked by one of the Kinzels in near, in near Kiev. So, the, but it is a very volatile fluid situation. And, and this is the time the, the uh, military industrial complex, companies like Raytheon, north of Grumman and Lockheed are really pushing hard to, uh, to make missile defense the, uh, in, in, in terms of making sure the funding is not uh, touched in the next uh, uh, decade or so. So we have uh, our work cut out for us. And uh, so I, I leave it at that. Thank you. Uh. Subrata, you have said so much and you have a lot, so much experience with the fallacy of missile defense. Uh, you know, like we talked about THAAD, the THAAD. Yes. HAD, right, as I, you know, was looking at it and I thought that really stands for theoretically hypothetical <laughs> artificial intelligence. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go to our questions. We have four minutes uh, and I see uh, Bill, why don't you give your question and let's see if there's somebody else. If you have another question, raise your hand also. Bill. Thank you. In 1971, I was in the State Department and I attended a meeting on this subject of ABMs. The technical experts were unanimous and concluding that they could not possibly be successful because the attacker could frustrate the ABM with decoys. Uh, 15 years later in Reykjavik, uh, Reagan and Gorbachev were on the verge of abandoning or agreeing to abandon nuclear weapons until ABMs were raised by Reagan, um, which were anathema to Gorbachev. My question, has there ever been any refutation of the technical opinion given in 1971 that these ABMs could not possibly be successful because of decoys? Um, I, absolutely no change in the technical assessment of the strategic system, the ABM system, and um, uh, American Physical Society and other scientists um, have, have, have published report after report, Union of Concerned Scientists, and uh, people like me have, uh, but more uh, um, uh, authoritative people like from the APS and others have given this opinion that the strategic systems for the so-called mid-course intercept, which is the system where the missile is intercepted in mid-course, there is a 20 to 25 minutes of flight time in in extra atmosphere in space, and it's going at uh, a, a huge speed. And, um, and then uh, it's reaching about 900 miles or so altitude, and you intercept it in, 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 in there, because that's the biggest time you have available. And there is no system that has proven the EXO, and also in the boost phase, and still the EXO, I mean, extra atmosphere, above atmosphere, there is no system at all. So there are some shorter range systems that are proving to be a little more effective because the systems are for sh short range, meaning uh, uh, slower missiles, like the arrows in, Euro in Israel intercepting 
uh, Hamas type rockets and stuff like that. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions for Subrata? Uh, Susan, it looks like there's a couple of questions in the chat. Tom and uh, Donald. I, I I see that. I okay. We have sort of like one more minute for question for Subrata. Uh, Tom, do you want to ask your question now, or do you want to wait? Uh, let's unmute Tom. Oh uh, hi! I put a question in the chat. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if there's a distinction to be made between uh, <clears throat> laser laser based weapons and directed directed energy weapons because I've been hearing a lot more about the latter lately. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, laser is just part of the electromagnetic radiation so a spectrum. So you 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 have other systems. Uh, uh, that can also transmit power in in the in in the spectrum. But when we talk about high power systems uh, uh, for any distance uh, interception of missiles or something, we are really talking about laser systems. And again, there is um, no system known uh, right now uh, that can do that. The high power lasers are extremely difficult to build. And the transmission of power in atmosphere because of scattering and thermal blooming, et cetera, is very difficult. Uh, one, one thing I, at this point, I, uh, I just take this as a side, but I forgot to mention that the impact of the ABM treaty was, was not only to keep peace, but it also prohibited development of weapons in space. And today, as I was reviewing this stuff, I went to look at the North of Grumman uh, 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 description of the standard missile three, where they are advertising that SM3 can shoot down satellites. This is unbelievable that we are doing that today. In the 80s, Senator Kennedy was in the lead in stopping any kind of anti-satellite test. So the directed energy weapons are more short range, much more short range in nature. Uh, like this business of the um, the debate about the embassies and uh, the, you know, the um, folks that were being um, fried or whatever term you want to use in the embassy. Yes. That was under the category most likely of a directed energy weapon. That could be my, I, I, I thought that was microwave. I'm not sure. Yeah, microwave. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, they tried the 400 kilometer range device with the anti uh, um, uh, ABL system, the airborne laser system, and it totally failed. Mm hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Sabrata. Thanks for the question, Tom and Bill. Oh, thank you. Let's go to Patrick. Thanks, Susan. So there are a couple of questions from Donald and Timothy, but um, they're mostly about Patriots. So I guess maybe we could kick them to, um, uh, Richard's gonna talk about Patriots. Yeah. So maybe we can, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Those great. questions will be for Richard. Yep, great. So let me uh, share my screen here. Uh, blah, blah, blah. All right, I assume that you can all see that. So uh, Subrata just gave us a nice rundown of, uh, well, ballistic missile defense in general, but specifically focused on defense against intercontinental ballistic missiles. So missiles that can travel over uh, 5,500 kilometers. Uh, and you can see here, this is a diagram of kind of the full spectrum. It doesn't get into the more technical details. There are a lot of systems involved, but uh, just at a surface level, this kind of shows the um, the the offensive systems, offensive ballistic missile systems, and on the left here the defensive systems that are intended to uh, to intercept these missiles. So as I said, Subrata just talked about the ICBMs, which are, as he mentioned, primarily defended against by the uh, uh, ground-based mid-course uh, defense system or the GMD. Uh, I will be focusing on. Uh, so the, the medium range and intermediate range ballistic missiles. So we're talking missiles that can travel between 1,000 and 5,500 kilometers. Uh, and these are intended, at least from the U.S. perspective, 
to be intercepted by uh, the FAD system and the Aegis system. Uh, although um, these two also have capabilities, Aegis has capabilities against uh, its claims against uh, ICBMs as well. But I will be focusing on yeah these two defenses against medium and inter intermediate range ballistic missiles. So we'll start with THAAD. Uh, Susan mentioned THAAD. So the, the, that stands for the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense. Uh, and actually, uh, before just this, this word terminal, um, these ballistic missiles have roughly three phases. Um, so they have a boost phase when they are um, being launched by rocket fuel into the atmosphere. And then once they uh, clear the atmosphere, uh, they're just um, they lose their their fuel source and they're just flying based off of their uh, trajectory through outer space. And then uh, this final part here, when they re-enter the atmosphere, is known as the terminal phase. And these defensive systems can be divided, uh, can be classified based on where they are intended to intercept. So, uh, as I mentioned, the the mid course defense system intercepts in the in the mid course. Uh, and the terminal defensive systems like FAD intercept in this final stage when they re-enter the atmosphere. So uh, hence the name, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense. Um, this is this is a truck mounted um, a truck mounted defense system against intermediate range ballistic missiles, and it's primarily developed by Lockheed Martin and uh, and our very own Raytheon uh, that's based or was based here in Massachusetts. Um, so this is a rough schematic of what that, the FAD system looks like, and this shows a little bit more of the complexity that I that was missing from the previous one. So you see here that the, this truck-mounted launcher with interceptor missiles that are intended to intercept uh, this this threat missile, the enemy missile. Um, but then, in addition, you need to have very sophisticated radar systems that are able to detect. And uh, to detect these warheads and track them, and then also discriminate because, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the use of decoys can be used to evade these defensive systems. So these radar systems are really crucial components. Uh, in addition, you have um, systems that 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 control the firing of the weapons and these command systems. Uh, these are mostly developed by Lockheed Martin, so the launchers, uh, the interceptors, the fire control, the command center. Uh, the radar systems, on the other hand, are developed by Raytheon. Um, and you can see here that, I'll talk about this a little more in the next slide, but uh, you see here two, two of these uh, TPY-2 radar systems, uh, and one of them is said here operating in terminal-based mode, and the other is operating in forward-based mode. So just keep that in mind. That'll uh, come up in the next slide and a few more slides. So right, so uh, Raytheon is developing this uh, this ANTPY2 radar, um, and this operates in two modes. So there is the um, the so-called terminal mode. So that has a shorter range. It's a shorter range radar and is intended to uh, intended to track missiles uh, closer to the target. So in the terminal phase. Uh, in addition, though, you have these forward-based uh, forward based mode uh, TPY-2 radars that have a longer range, and they're intended to track the, tar the, uh, track the target closer to, um, to its launch point. So as you can see here in the schematic, the uh, if I can go back. Okay, I can't go back for some reason, but uh, yeah, so the forward, your forward uh, radar is going to be closer to your you know, so-called enemy. And uh, your terminal will be closer to uh, the area that you're trying to defend. And all of these make up the FAD system. As uh, you can see here on the right is an example of the FAD, of the uh, TPY-2 radar. Uh, but these TP2, TPY-2 radars don't just, uh, aren't just defend, don't just defend against uh, intermediate range ballistic missiles, but also form part of this GMD that Subrata talked about in defending against ICBMs. So you see here, this is uh, these are all the components of the GMD interceptors radars uh, all over the world. Uh, and you can see here in yellow are the deployments of the TPY-2 radars uh, in Japan and also a few in the Middle East. Uh, so you can see here a very complex network 
of US-led um, ICBM missile defense. Um, but I wanna to stick to the intermediate range ballistic missiles. So the SAD system has been in the news recently. Some of you might have seen it because of its um, relation to tensions on the Korean Peninsula. So for the past uh, decade or so, there have been talks of deploying a SAD system on the, on the, on, in South Korea, uh, which finally happened in spring of 2017. Uh, this is intended for defense against North Korean missiles, but as I mentioned in the next slide, this, uh, this claim is contested. And you can see here that this SAD system is intended to form part of one component of a layered defense uh, for South Korea. Uh, so you see here the SAD system, um, but also in conjunction with a Patriot missile system and also uh, an Aegis uh, ship mounted um, interceptors as well, which I'll, I'll talk about the Aegis in a few slides also. Um, so, sorry, I just want to hide this. Uh, yeah, so China has not uh, received these SAD systems warmly on the Korean Peninsula. Um, as I mentioned, the, the stated purpose is for defense against North Korean missiles, but China claims that these TPY-2 missiles are actually intended uh, to spy, to surveil their uh, uh, missile launches. Um, and they consider this a, a threat to their national security. So as I mentioned, uh, these, these radar systems are intended to be, the stated purpose is for them to operate in terminal mode. So they detect North Korean missiles that are entering the atmosphere um, in a relatively close range. Um, but as I mentioned, that these, these radar systems can be operated in a forward mode where they have much longer uh, range sensitivity, uh, so far enough to be able to spy on China, basically. So you can see here in this diagram, is, is you see here, this is the radius of the detection uh, for the terminal phase mode for the TPY-2. And then this uh, arrow out here kind of shows the, the reach of the forward base. So much longer, you know, can kind of penetrate deep into China. Um, and this is a quote from the People's Daily, which is the, the uh, Chinese Communist Party's uh, Central Committee's main, uh, main newspaper. They say if SAD is really deployed in South Korea, then China-South Korea relations will face the possibility of getting ready to cut off diplomatic relations. And this is obviously before the deployment, uh, and then it eventually was deployed in 2017. Um, China did uh, hit Korea with economic sanctions, but then later in 2017, these economic sanctions were uh, were rolled back because of um, because of a deal with South Korea and a promise given by their president Moon Jae-in, his so-called three no's. So so he promised the Chinese that there would be no further SAD deployments on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, they they would not integrate their missile defense system into this. To this web of US-led international missile defense that I mentioned earlier, and that they would not join any trilateral alliance with the US and Japan. So you could see that this, these missile defense systems, uh, you know, far from being uh, protectors, uh, are actually doing quite a bit in way of, um, you know, provoking uh, tensions and inflaming tensions. I want to talk briefly about the, uh, the Aegis ballistic missile defense system. Uh, so these are ship mounts. This is also a defense against intermediate range ballistic missiles. Uh, these are ship mounted. So you see here, this is a, a photo of one of these SM3 interceptors being launched from a U.S. warship. Uh, these SM3s are developed by Raytheon. The radar system for the for Aegis is developed by uh, Lockheed Martin, as well as the launchers. Uh, and the last I checked, although this is a figure from uh, a couple years ago, there were 47 uh, Aegis capable warships around the globe, although the, the military has stated they want 65 by 2025. Um, and, you know, these are operating in the, um, in the, the, the South China Sea, in the, the, um, the Baltic Sea, so within striking distance of Russia and um, um, uh, China and Russia, respectively. Uh, there's also a variant, a land-based variant called Aegis Ashore. Uh, these come into, uh, these are relevant when talking about the Ukraine war because there are bases, you can see here up at the top right, what one of these looks like. 
Uh, and there are bases in Romania and Poland. So in Russia's so-called sphere of influence, um, and this has been the provocation to the Russians. They claim that this is a violation of the uh, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, uh, although that's kind of irrelevant because Trump pulled the U.S. out of that a few years ago. Um, so this point about, you know, is this, is this missile defense or is this missile offense? Well, in the case of these um, the, of the Aegis system, which use these so-called Mark 41 launchers, uh, they they are actually interoperable as offensive systems. So, so the Mark 41 in the ballistic missile defense mode, they can launch these SM3 missiles, but they're also able to launch Tomahawk cruise missiles developed by Raytheon, um, which have a capability to be nuclear tipped. Uh, although they were re retired by Obama, but um, you can see here this is a catalog for the Mark 41 from Lockheed Martin, and they tout the the kind of versatility of this launcher. So they say, yeah, it can be used for ballistic missile defense, uh, but it can also be used for uh, these Tomahawk cruise missiles. And the Russians are quite aware of this. So this is just a quote from the Russian ambassador to the US from a couple of years ago. And he states that, um, uh, you know, the, the fact that defensive American Mark 41 launchers, which are located in Romania and are to be deployed in Poland, can be adapted for launching offensive Tomahawk strike missiles. Uh, and they, he says that when we express concern about this, we are told in effect to just trust us. Uh, and I just wanna end just briefly about talking about the cost. So not only are these things uh, inflaming tensions around the world and uh, you know, likely don't even work, but they also cost quite a bit of money. So uh, but the Biden administration has requested 29.8 billion for fiscal year 2024 for ballistic missile defense systems. This is up from 5.1 billion from last year. And just looking at the, the intermediate range defense systems that I mentioned, uh, they've requested 1.8 billion for Aegis and about half a billion for, for the FAD system. So a lot of money being pumped into these, uh, these systems and Raytheon and Lockheed are making a, a killing off of them. So I think that's all I have. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, if you have any questions, be happy to take them. So thank you so much, Patrick. Um, pretty, uh, pretty scary. We know where our money is going, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What priorities are. Uh, I see uh, Bill Root's hand up. Uh, does anybody else, uh, and we'll get to your question in a minute, Bill. Anybody else aside from Bill have a question? I see some questions. Uh, so in Jeff, Jeffrey and Donna, Jeffrey and Donald have their hands up, Susan. Oh, do they? Okay, I they didn't do, see yeah. that. Uh, thank you so much. So let's see. Um, you want me to go ahead? I. So who is the first person? Jeffrey well, I was goes the next. Uh, well, let's see. We heard from uh, uh, Bill got to ask a question. So let's go with Jeffrey and then Donald and then Bill. And we have just, uh, you know, four minutes for this. Uh, we've got a lot more to do. So try to keep your questions as questions for Patrick. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. I know. Now, why can't why can't we invest? First off, why can't why can't the U.S. Mil military invest more in this? In nuclear defense system than actual nuclear weapons, in, for example, for example, and second, and second, secondly, for China, secondly, this could be a good, a uh, good up. I got more. I got a lot, but um, since I missed most of the thing, missed most of the record, missed most of the webinar during because I was doing chores and all. But um, maybe this, maybe we just, we can work work something out and help help make a positive change to get more people involved in this kind of thing. So, you know, like a, a video game, if you know what I mean. And, uh, you know, I'm working on that, but I, I could use some don't use some money to help hire people and advertise. And so, uh, and so, sorry, and sec oh, third, thirdly, I remember this prediction, someone that the dream. Have you ever heard of the dream detective, Chris Robinson? Uh, no, I can't say I have. Well, I remember this prediction very well that China will swallow up both North North and South Korea. But I think that what you, when you mentioned that North North Korea in there, I think this might actually be a provoker for China to actually swallow up swallow up 
them both. What do you? What? Do you, so, what's your thoughts on the, all three? Um. Well, so I'll, I'll take the first part first. So, um. Uh. Right. So, why are we investing so much in in uh, offensive systems as opposed to defensive systems? That was the question. Kind of, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um. Well, I mean, I think ideally the the U.S. military would like to have very strong offensive uh, and defensive systems. Um, you know, I, Subrata talked about this strategic uh, balance between offensive and defensive systems. And, um, you know, the, the U.S. doesn't, they want to be able to, being able to threaten other countries like Russia and, and other even non-nuclear countries gives, you know, from their point of view, gives them a lot of leverage in international politics. So I don't know that they really want to just go purely uh, defensive. I'm just talking from the perspective of uh, the government. Um, I mean, if you compare costs, um, and this was a big part of the debate leading up to the ABM treaty, a big reason why folks like uh, Secretary of Defense McNamara um, really didn't want to get into the ballistic missile defense game and really wanted to just focus on strengthening our offensive systems was that it's a lot cheaper to develop offensive uh, systems than it is defensive systems. Just given how complex of a problem ballistic missile defense is, um, the, the the investment that it would take is orders of magnitude more than, or maybe not orders of mag maybe an order of magnitude more than investment in offensive systems would need to be. So. Um, yeah, just from a purely economic standpoint, but of course they're investing in both. So it's not like a zero, zero sum game necessarily. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's go to Donald. You, you, you can answer the other two late. If you, if we kept the rush, so we, you, he can answer the other two later. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, maybe you can send me an email. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'll send you a link to the fundraiser. Donald. Yeah. And, okay. So my question is, it's sorry to ask the question, but I'm, paying, I'm playing the devil's advocate. So, yeah, so please, someone explain the stories we hear that in um, in Ukraine that they keep saying that the missile defenses shot down Russian incoming missiles. But the speakers today said that that, that the missile defense doesn't work well. So, did did they work or did they not in Ukraine? Sorry. Uh, I, I maybe Subrata, do you want to take this? I have some thoughts, but. No, uh, but it's a, it, it's a, I'm sorry, Susan, Susan, yes. Oh, I was just wondering, is that something that Richard is going to talk about? Or oh, okay. Subrata, which one? No, that's fine. Richard, Richard can talk about that. Yes, yes, I will be talking about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, um, I urge you to raise your virtual hand if you've got a question. And uh, we want to hear from uh, Richard, who's got a lot um a lot of good things to say, and we'll hopefully we'll have time later to uh, get to questions. So Bill, hold on to your question because we'll have some time at the end for Q and A. And just to say, although we said that this would be one hour, uh, we can always go for an extra 15 minutes if people are available uh, and you still have questions. So don't feel like, you know, if you haven't gotten it in, you uh, it'll never be answered. Also to know that this wonderful program is being recorded and we'll send um, a video of it with, to everybody who registered with whatever um, thoughts, you know, uh, resources we can. I just want to take a minute, Richard, before we go to you, um, I'd like to quick go to Paul Shannon because I think he's got some announcements and something special for us to do. And then we'll go to you, Richard, okay? Okay, well, thanks, Susan. I know people wanna get, uh, get to Richard fast. I know I do, um, but let me just say that uh, the uh, Raytheon anti-war campaign join, has joined forces with, the, with Susan and uh, Patrick's uh, nuclear disarmament working group uh, that's been operating for a long time to form the Raytheon uh, nuclear weapons campaign. Um, Raytheon, as you know, is everywhere in Massachusetts, especially Eastern Massachusetts. As you can see from these slides, they make just about everything related 
uh, to nuclear weapons, as well as to conventional weapons, of course, which is what we started focusing on. But we decided mm -hmm. that since Raytheon is such a large producer of nuclear weapons systems, and since they are here, we want to use Raytheon's presence and the danger of the weapons that they are creating uh, to raise the, raise the call for nuclear disarmament and specifically to raise a, uh, a mobilization of people in support of the TPNW, the, the treaty that would uh, forbid all nuclear weapons. So we want to use Raytheon's presence here to say, you think the, these decisions are in Washington and in international capitals, but they are coming right out of Massachusetts. And this is our responsibility mm -hmm. here, given the fact that we are right at the center uh, of this nuclear arms race and creating all these dangerous situations. This is our responsibility to demand that Raytheon stop making nuclear weapons, but more important, to raise, to use Raytheon's presence here in Massachusetts to develop a really strong movement for nuclear disarmament. We invite all of you to join us uh, when we send the link to the um, to the video of tonight's program, we will send you a, a digital form where you can sign up. We're trying to pull as many people into this campaign as possible and hope you will consider joining us. Okay, let's go to Richard. Okay, oh wait, no wait, one second. Uh, just to say, Paul, that the next meeting of the Raytheon nuclear weapons campaign is in fact on Monday, right? Yeah. And if uh, we'll invite everyone who's interested. Okay. And then, and, yeah. And then also we have a, an action to take, don't we? Right well, here. Or well, do you want to yeah. We, we, let's, we like to use these webinars, not just for information, but actually to have people take action uh, to try to try to oppose some of these uh, horrible things that are going on and to deal with some of these dangers. So, uh, Cole has put up uh, a link in the chat uh, to this um, to this uh, urgent message that will go to Congress, telling uh, Congress to oppose in every way possible the development of a U.S. space force, which is in operation, and uh, it's going to cost a lot of money, and it is extremely dangerous by putting these types of systems we're talking about in outer space. Uh, just an incredibly dangerous move. And so we're hoping that everyone will take just a second here to click on the uh, link that Cole has put in the, uh, in the chat and quickly fill out this, uh, this form uh, protesting the Space Force. It will go to your various members of Congress by magic. It goes to your very representative somehow uh, and they will get this message from you. So please take 30 seconds to click on that link that Cole has put in the chat and to fill in this uh, urgent alert to your members of Congress against this development of the US Space Force. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Paul. And uh, again, this is gonna be in the chat um, and just takes um, really quick time to fill it out. But let's now hear from Richard. Um, unlike uh, strategic or intercontinental nuclear missiles uh, and intermediate range nuclear missiles, tactical or short range or battlefield nuclear missiles have never been subject to any international agreement, any international treaty. They are completely unregulated in terms of their size, their numbers, their blast force, their delivery systems. Um, this fact has put us all in great danger due to the new generation of nuclear weapons. The main difference between the new generation that's being built now and the previous generation is that the new ones are super duper accurate. The previous generation had accuracies measured in the hundreds of meters. The new generation has accuracies measured in three meters to 30 meters. Uh, and so when you have a new generation of nuclear weapons that include 
battlefield nuclear weapons for the first time ever that are super accurate and can have variable dialable blast yields, it's very tempting to use them because you can have, they're so accurate, you can have a tiny warhead, relatively speaking, that would do far less collateral damage uh, than would be the case. And in, in the previous generation, you'd need a much larger warhead because it's so inaccurate and you'd have enormous collateral damage. So that makes the use of battlefield nuclear weapons attractive. Uh, both Russia and the US have uh, lots of them. We have uh, tactical bombs that are dialable uh, from 143rd the size of a Hiroshima bomb to uh, six times the size of a Hiroshima bomb. Uh, we have um, cruise missiles, uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles, subsonic that can have variable size nuclear warheads on them. Um, and uh, that, uh, that th these are all deployed now. They're deployed all over the place. Uh, and we also have artillery shells that have small atomic bombs. A, a regular 155 millimeter howitzer can fire an atomic bomb uh, 10 miles or so that would have a blast uh, about 120, one, 120th the size of the Hiroshima blast. These are all weapons that both Russia and the US have that could be used in the war in Ukraine. Russia is not going to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine unless it feels it's seriously losing. If it feels that way, it will definitely use nuclear weapons because it views this war as an existential threat. To have a nuclear armed Ukraine and NATO on a 1300 mile Russian border, uh, they view as a, an existential threat to the existence of Russia. So therefore they will use nuclear weapons if pushed into a corner. The US has a very different outlook on this war. The purpose of the war is to seriously weaken Russia over the bodies of the Ukrainians in order to preserve some semblance of US global dominance for another decade or two before the inevitable unification of the Eurasian continent. How desperate is the US leadership to prolong this uh, US dominance a little longer? I don't know, but they seem to be pretty crazy given things they've done so far to do that. So, uh, there's no expert, who, as far as I know, about this one, but I rate the chances of who's going to use a nuclear weapon first in Ukraine as 50-50. Right now, the Russians are winning, uh, not in territory, but they're still winning because they have superior firepower. They're killing a lot more Ukrainians and a lot more armored vehicles than the Ukrainians are. Uh, that's the way it is right now. We don't know how it's going to be. Next year, the uh, NATO countries are beefing up all the production of all these systems. They're going to be sending more. They're going to be sending F-16 jets for the first time. Uh, you know, there's not many more red lines to be crossed. Uh, probably after the jets, the only one remaining is cruise missiles with a thousand mile range. And you can't shoot them down because they hug the ground and you can't see them. Um, so, uh, we're in danger of, uh, we're edging closer to nuclear, the outbreak of the use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Patriot systems, uh, the Raytheon SM3 are probably best at shooting down incoming warheads, uh, but they miss most of them. Uh, uh, and uh, so that you can't say that there is any kind of effective uh, defense. Um, and so what, what's, what's going to happen? One side uses a nuclear weapon. What's the other side going to do? It's just going to let it pass? I don't think so. There's going to be a nuclear response. Now we're going to wait and see. Oh, is the other side going to use a bigger weapon now? Are they going to use more than one little warhead weapon? And then if they do, what, what's the other side going to do in response? So far, the war games indicate rapid escalation into a pretty serious nuclear war, which puts a significant 
portion of all life forms on earth in a very precarious position. The greatest environmental threat facing the world today is not global warming, it's nuclear war emerging out of the conflict in Ukraine. All these Raytheon uh, missile defense systems that are in Ukraine now, the Patriot, the AMRAM, the Sea Sparrow, the NASAM, uh, they're all what in, in battlefield terminology, not in the intermediate range strategic terminology, but in battlefield terminology, uh, these are sort of uh, mid-range uh, missiles, and they have ranges of about 30 to 40 miles. What good are they right now in the conflict in Ukraine? Not much. Where are the Russian airplanes? Very few of them even leave Russian territory. They launch uh, standoff missiles and glide bombs that can travel uh, uh, 30 to 50 miles farther than the airplane. So all of these uh, to somewhat effective Raytheon anti-missile systems are, are at this point useless against Russian aircraft because there's no Russian aircraft within range. They are useful against uh, drones. They are somewhat useful against Russian missiles that have been fired, although mostly they just miss. In some cases, it's strange to use them at all because on a drone, for example, because the missile costs uh, 50 times as much as the drone you're trying to shoot down with it and so on. Uh, so that's an example of uh, how ineffective battlefield missile defense is right now. Uh, as uh, Patrick mentioned, the SM-3, uh, Raytheon's SM-3 is the, at the moment, supposedly the best thing we've got. The Pentagon tells us it has shot down a satellite. The Pentagon tells us it has shot down an incoming uh, intermediate range nuclear warhead. I don't know if this is true or if it's rep replicable or if they made it easy because there were no decoys, so on and so forth. But this is what's been deployed in Russia and Poland. And as Patrick mentioned, the launch tube is the same size uh, that would take the Tomahawk nuclear tip missile. They were flying on US aircraft until Obama removed them in 2013, but we have no evidence that the warheads were destroyed and they could be redeployed and snuck into the launch tubes in Romania and Poland. That's why Russia worries so much. Uh, so that's uh, basically the situation that we're facing now and uh, the horror of what could emerge um, next year uh, on the battlefield in Ukraine. That's enough. Wow, Richard, you have, uh, you've spelled it out. All three of you have uh, in, in your own way. Oh, wait, there's one thing I forgot to mention that Subrata forgot to mention about the strategic. What's the consequence of the US new generation of nuclear weapons. Well, he mentioned that one of the consequences is probably the Russian hypersonic missile that we haven't even got yet. Um, you know, they're, they're developing more sophisticated both attack and defense systems. But the biggest change is the change in China, which is uh, in a very speedy uh, production and deployment process to triple or quadruple the deployed intercontinental ballistic uh, nuclear missiles that they have from about 300 to 1200. So this is happening right now. And it's uh, probably the most serious strategic consequence at this point of the new generation of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Thank may, you. may I include something with what you just said? Okay. Thank, thank you. There's a there's an old phrase about that about that you know when you mentioned when you mentioned about no, no evidence of those more has been destroyed. Well, here here's what I I got this from a video game and I think it's a very good quote. The world won't change for the better unless we trust people. Trust is vital in a peaceful world. 
Okay. Then. Thank you. Thank you for that. I uh, and a little ray of hope, given I, uh, I, uh, what Richard you have talked about. Uh, so thank you all. I you know we're going to get to. Uh, I see three more hands here, and we're going to get to those questions. This has been uh, an important uh, and interesting discussion. Uh, and all I can say is, is that at our meetings, our missile defense meetings, uh, it has been fascinating just to uh, be a part of and, and listen to all of uh, this kind of thinking. And Patrick, do you know when the next meeting is? of our missile defense, uh, which is, you know, anybody is invited to come to that. Patrick, uh, when that yeah, is? Yeah, I think we had decided on September 26th at noon. Okay, and we will put that in the message that goes out to everybody registered. So please uh, continue uh, the discussion and join us at those meetings and join us at the, if you're in Massachusetts, the Raytheon nuclear weapons campaign. Let's go to some questions. Um, Bill, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip over you to get to somebody who hasn't spoken yet. Uh, and Hiroki, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Do you want to unmute? Uh, you're, Cole, can you unmute? Karaoke? Thank you. I did, maybe. Can you? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I put so many comments on the question, but... Um, <laughs> so is anybody uh, can support the petition asking the US government to do a joint R&D of uh, laser defense system among at least a bank alliance partners. So that is my that was question. A question. Question about laser systems? Yeah. Laser system or just alternatives? Suggestion of alternatives from your movement. Not on the, you know, uh, objecting. <laughs> So, Brad, so do you understand question. that question? Uh, I, yeah, I not quite understood. Are you saying the petition is calling for U.S. to join, develop joint development of laser defense systems with other countries? Yeah, or join or initiate. Um, you know, these systems, first of all, they don't work. Another big waste of time, but Given that aside, living that aside, uh, these systems are also defense offenses. Just as uh, Richard was saying, they're just the you know one side or the other side of the coin, and uh, it's very difficult to differentiate uh, laser systems. Let me just give you a quick anecdote. I was in U.S. Congress on the uh, House Armed Services Committee, and I was invited by the army to go to the high laser test facility in White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico to witness their defensive satellite um, um, uh, um, uh, laser interaction test. Well, this was no, no defensive. What they were doing is with the laser, shine on the satellite and disable all its electroptics. So the satellite just went out of, out, out of control. Now, it was a dead satellite that the US had. So it can be easily done. So it was a defensive system, but on the same time, it's, a, it's an offensive system. So I am not in I favor. I should say of, uh, the joint R&D of uh, laser EG system, not on the outer space. Yeah, <laughs> the laser goes far <laughs> and the, they, the push in the United on States. On ship or on track. Yes. yes. But uh, well, uh, it, it's something uh, uh, people can consider, but I am not in favor of initiating high power laser research jointly with other NATO allies. Good. 
So we can do that then. No. <laughs> Why not? You have, you, yes, you certainly. So you concern the development. You can ignore of my opinion. As we, we say, space um, weapons, right? So we just limit the space weapon then, just limit the laser easy system or just uh, like a laser system on track. We can have a discussion offline if you want to send me something, I, we can. Uh, we can, from our missile defense group, we can look at it and maybe give you an opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did it before then. <laughs> so any progress? Okay. And again, we remember that, uh, you know, uh, defense is really offense in that, uh, but you're so most we can discuss to join about What is the aspect of uh, offense and defense of the missile uh, defense system as well? Um, let's go to, let's see, I thank see, you. Uh, thank you thank for you so your question, yes. um, Bill and then Paul. Bill, do you have a quick question? Yeah, I have two quick questions. I think it was Patrick that mentioned that radar was coping with decoys, and I was wondering if that was really successful. The other question has to do with existential threat to Russia, and there, that's not a, a radar or a decoy question, that's a fact. Uh, they've got good reason to fear for their existential existence, and the peace agreement in Ukraine should include full membership for Russia and NATO. And you've got to recognize it, they need it. Okay, is that a question? It seems like both for Patrick and Richard. You both want to comment about that, Richard and, and Patrick? Well, I'd like to get the decoy radar business from Patrick. Yep. Yeah, to the point about, um, I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, the, the um, you know, these systems are not, you know, well, there's certainly not much public information on their effectiveness, but um, Subrata had mentioned the American Physical Society report uh, that came out recently. They did a study of the ground, uh, the ground-based mid-course defense system against ICBMs, but they just looked at North Korean ICBMs, so fairly unsophisticated relative to say Russian ICBMs, and they determined that uh, the ground, the GMD would not be effective against uh, uh, these decoys. I mean. You're right. I mean, I think that is one of the major problems with these defensive systems is their inability to discriminate against uh, decoys and determine what is a, um, you know, what is the decoy and what is the missile, particularly in the mid-course phase, uh, because you're out of the atmosphere, it can become very difficult to distinguish these uh, decoys. Um, and so, yeah, I, it's, there, there are other complications, uh, but I think the decoys is probably one of the biggest ones. And to my knowledge, there's no good, uh, good solution for that. Richard? Uh, and regarding uh, the, the solution of reversing course and inviting Russia in, into full me membership in NATO, to me, that's a trick question uh, because NATO exists to uh, defeat Russia, to weaken Russia, to dismember Russia. Uh, got and uh, so, you know, if you're not going to fight with Russia, then NATO has no meaning, really. I guess it could all be that all that can be transposed into fighting with China, I guess. But uh, uh, I, it just doesn't compute for me in the real historical world, the notion of inviting Russia into NATO. The, okay. the other thing, just, just real fast, the other thing I, want, I meant to say was, um, you know, in addition to these decoys creating a problem, the, 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 the other issue is that you're not really just defending against one missile, most likely. I mean, in practice, you'll likely be defending against multiple missile strikes, either multiple launches and or multiple warheads on a single rocket. So even if you're able to, to, to discriminate decoys with some low probability likely for one 
rocket for one warhead, the the chances of doing that for all of them is is very low. So, thank you for your question. Thanks for answering, uh, Paul. Yeah, I want to thank the speakers. I had no idea that uh, these different uh, missiles were focused on different uh, range nuclear weapons, um, and and that you had to come up with different uh, defensive missiles for different types of nuclear weapons and different ranges and all this type of stuff. And so that means in the future, as there are all kinds of new nuclear weapons, you'll have to come up with new missile defense systems to try to take those down. Uh, so the whole thing is, is uh, I think you've made it very clear how totally ludicrous uh, the whole situation is. But the que my question is about these uh, defensive missiles, so-called defensive missiles, are, evidently they use both against nuclear missiles, but also conventional missiles. In, in, in Ukraine, they're, they're shooting, trying to shoot down conventional missiles. Are these the same missile defense missiles that will be used against uh, nuclear weapons? My, my guess is that it's easier to shoot down uh, a non-nuclear missile or plane or whatever than it is to uh, destroy an incoming nuclear missile. Is, is that true? Are the nuclear missiles it, clear? It, or? It's a little harder to shoot down uh, intermediate range and uh, strategic weapons because they're exo-atmospheric. And, right. and when they re-enter the atmosphere, they're re-entering the atmosphere at extremely high velocities, uh, higher velocities than any of the missiles, the shorter range missiles that never leave the atmosphere. And so they're always slower and and easier to shoot down. So yes, it is the same. The, the same systems would be shooting down Russian airplanes if the Russian airplanes ever came within range, but they don't have to. So they're not being used against Russian airplanes. The same missiles uh, are being used uh, with varying degrees of success to shoot down, very successful at shooting down drones, but. Uh, that's hardly worth the effort since the drones don't cost anything. Uh, and they're a little bit successful at shooting down some of the Russian missiles. Um, the only one that is uh, really clearly and more or less exclusively designed for uh, the uh, intermediate range and strategic missiles is the uh, terminal air defense that Patrick discussed and the SM, the Raytheon SM3, that's on the Polish-Romanian border. Those are the two deployed systems that uh, may have some effectiveness against uh, the the exo-atmospheric warheads. So the question of whether or not the, they're effective in Ukraine against non-nuclear missiles is kind of irrelevant to whether or not those systems would be effective against uh, nuclear missiles that go outside go outside the atmosphere. Susan, yes and no. Can I just make a comment on this? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, uh, actually, uh, just, uh, just an aside, but it's relevant that this success of this air, air missile defense systems that are, um, that Ukraine is claiming it happened to be primarily old Soviet and Russian systems, S-200. Russia has S-300 and S-400 and S-500. So Ukraine has a lot of S-200s that it got from all the Eastern European NATO countries and so forth. And, and they are actually doing the battle. We, we don't have that many missile defense systems to deliver to Ukraine. We did four Patriot batteries. And, 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 and even then they're not all operational. Was, one was brought in and I said it was hit by a Kinzo. So it, these are all Russian systems, actually. Okay, um, we have one more person who hasn't asked a question yet. Uh, Robin, can you ask a quick question? Because we are wow. all over our time here. Yeah, um, 
Well, because uh, war is insane and having nuclear weapons is more insane. And we're always going to have sociopath leaders like Putin and Xi and uh, leaders of the weapon makers and the U.S. empire builders. They're going to keep making all these weapons. The only solution I can see is to make the U.N. stronger than any country and prevent all these countries from making these dangerous weapons and, uh, you know, and stopping the 54 civil wars that are going on. And I made a plan how to do that. It would be difficult, but the only way, uh, isn't that the only way to stop all this crap from, you know, destroying the world and, you know, the global warming going on at the same time is to have a, a strong UN that keeps peace going on. It it doesn't it doesn't have to be only the UN either. Uh, for example, uh, it would appear that the BRICS, uh, who are rapidly uh, growing in power as an international organization, uh, they seem uh, very interested in uh, hastening the end of the U.S. dominated multipolar world for a multipolar world. Uh, I'm just noting that uh, in a way that's even more powerful than the powers that the UN is given at this point in time, uh, because it's not just political, it's also the economic integration of these countries and so on. So I'm just saying in your favor, Robin, that there's more than just the UN, there are other international networks and organizations that I think are moving in the direction that you're talking about. I think um, let's end there. And with that I'll, sort of note. Hold up. I want to I add something to Robin Harper, um, please. Quickly. I'd like to talk to you more about that idea you mentioned. In fact, I had the same, very same thing, but more. I wanted to, I, I had the idea of creating a United Nations Armed Forces. You know, they would be instruct, they, if you know. You know what, I, 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 I just need to interrupt you. I am so sorry. Uh, there are lots of ideas about, uh, you know, what to do. And I hope that this discussion continues, uh, that we share our uh, our ideas uh, and is this Jeffrey uh, that you share your ideas with Robin um, and that we continue our discussion but then going from what you just brought up uh, and about you know the United Nations and Richard's response about uh, the BRICS and all the other organizations we have, to try to bring about uh, an end to nuclear arms race and the threat of the use of nuclear weapons. Among that is us as individuals and to what we can do, what we can do together uh, in wherever we live, uh, in Massachusetts, in I see people from California, uh, wherever we are, that we keep this discussion going and we keep on working so uh, thank you all, and thank you for this extended time. Thank you so much to our three speakers, Richard, Patrick, Subrata. Uh, thank you, Cole, for keeping us straight on here, and yeah. Paul for keeping us together, and for all of you who participated. Thank you. Oh, one I, last thing. I sent, I sent you guys my contact info, I, I including did you, Robin. That. Okay. So save, the, so save the chat if you're interested in ta talking to me, okay? Please save the chat. And again, we'll send something out to everybody who registered. So have a good, peaceful night and think of how we can go forward. Good no night. nukes. No nukes. <laughs>